so I'll just go a bit more into the science. Um, we've done the high level stuff that covered policy, et cetera. I just want to go into some of the underpinning science. So there's always a question. Uh, where do these greenhouse gas emissions come from? Um, uh, and, and are livestock really an important source of emissions? Isn't it just carbon in and carbon out? Well, as far as carbon dioxide is concerned, um, livestock are neither a source or a sink of carbon dioxide. Because what, what happens with, it, with a, a, a system that involves animals, um, the, the food they eat takes out carbon dioxide in photosynthesis. Some of that is lost back via plant respiration. So once the animal eats feed, um, it will respire carbon dioxide. It breathes carbon dioxide in and out. But some of its feed gets broken down, uh, and a group of bugs form methane. So some, some, of the thing, some of the gas that was taken out of the atmosphere as carbon dioxide gets returned as methane. Um, and then as far as you know, this animal waste, which then can give off carbon dioxide as they break down. And so the carbon dioxide, they're not a source or a sink of carbon dioxide. They take some out, and they give some back out to the atmosphere. Then they're not taking carbon dioxide or producing carbon dioxide. They are a source of methane because they convert some of this carbon dioxide into methane. So if you actually add up all the carbon atoms, they're completely carbon neutral. But they're not greenhouse gas neutral because some of the carbon that was taken out alongside an oxygen molecule, an atom, uh, carbon dioxide, actually goes back as methane. That's why they're a source of methane because they bring, in, in a sense, take out carbon dioxide but give a small proportion back as methane. There's a marketing campaign here. Cows are carbon neutral. <laughs> <laughs> that will just change everything, right? Yeah, unfortunately, that's the wrong yeah. unit to use, and that's no, 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 what no, no, farmers no, keep no, talking no, about. No, and no. that's exactly what's happened. People get mis misunderstand this. They are carbon neutral, but we're not actually talking about carbon. We're talking about greenhouse gases, and that's the and that's the confusion in in you know out there. And so I get letters every day. Oh, it's carbon neutral. You don't know what you're talking about. Unfortunately, it's about greenhouse gas neutral, and they're not greenhouse gas neutral. And the same with nitrous oxide. Um, of course, you know, plants take up nitrogen, um, and then uh, animals put it back out in the form of dung and urine. And in particular, urine, uh, as it gets transformed in the soil, nitrous oxide is a byproduct, so they're a source of nitrous oxide. So that's why. When we're talking about livestock, we're talking about methane and nitrous oxide. And we don't worry about carbon dioxide at all. The next one I get all the time, uh, which had a dollar for every time I've been, it's been pointed out to me that I don't understand the carbon cycle. Um, so why don't we count carbon stored in grass? The simple reason is we don't store carbon in grass, not above ground. Because if you think of a tree, we count the carbon stored in a tree, we plant a tree, and over time, the amount of carbon in that tree increases. So it's got carbon in its trunks, it's got carbon in its branches. And so if I look at a time period, I could measure the carbon here and measure the carbon there, and I've got a lot more carbon in that tree over time. It's a store of carbon until I chop it down, if I chop it down. If I look at grass, if I go and measure how much carbon I've got in, in my grass at the beginning of the year, and then go and measure how much carbon I've got at the end of the year, and I do that every year for 20 years, I don't see an increase in the carbon. Because you might start off, it grows within the year, but as soon as it's grown, the animal's eaten it, and then the animal has given off carbon dioxide, and it's given off methane. So it does not store. You could argue that it stores on about the, the interval of a grazing cycle. So if I have a grazing cycle of four weeks, yes, it stored it in that four weeks. But then as soon as I've eaten it, I've given off the carbon that was stored in the grass. So it's neutral. So grass does not act as a store of carbon. So we cannot say, um, you know, oh, well, I, I'm offsetting all those methane emissions because I'm storing carbon in grass. You are not. It's a static amount, and you do not continue to increase the amount stored in grass. Uh, unlike trees. So that's why we don't count the carbon stored in grass. 
because it doesn't change over time. Right, I have another little video. So how exactly is methane produced and how does it contribute to climate change? There are a lot of different stories out there, but this is how it actually works. Methane comes from several places, including wetlands, landfills, forest fires, agriculture and fossil fuel extraction. But here in New Zealand, the largest proportion by far is belched out by livestock. It's perfectly natural. Microbes in the forced stomach of ruminant animals like cows and sheep break down the pasture the animals have eaten and produce methane. And, well, it has to come out somehow. Well, it's true that methane released into the atmosphere breaks down much faster than other greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide. But while it exists, it has a big impact. Tonne for tonne, methane is actually many times more effective at absorbing heat than carbon dioxide. An emission of methane will mostly disappear from the atmosphere within 50 years. But while it's up there, every molecule traps lots of heat. An equivalent emission of carbon dioxide traps less heat, but stays around much, much longer. Thousands of years, in fact. We'll show you what it looks like. Let's say filling up the board with symbols is equivalent to a certain temperature increase. I'm emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere every year. Because CO2 takes so long to break down, every emission adds to the warming caused by previous emissions. The amount of CO2 increases over time and the effects become bigger and bigger. OK, I'm emitting methane into the atmosphere. Each emission makes a big contribution to warming, but fortunately we're not emitting nearly as much methane as we are carbon dioxide. So as we do this, Gavin is going to rub out the methane symbols to show they break down at a much faster rate in the atmosphere. And I'm going to continue emitting at the same rate. So if we keep emitting the same amount of methane, the amount in the atmosphere levels out, because the new emissions, by and large, just replace previous emissions that have now disappeared. <coughs> <coughs> But we've increased our methane emissions a lot over the past century. This has pushed temperatures up already, and they're still going up. If we keep emitting methane at the current rate, that will keep the atmosphere a lot warmer than it used to be. So at a minimum, if we want to stop additional warming from methane, we need to reduce the amount of emissions. They don't have to be stopped completely. But the more that they're reduced, the less warming is caused, and the better for the climate. How far could we go? Climate change is a complex challenge, but we've already achieved heaps thanks to some clever Kiwi innovation and farmers becoming more and more efficient. But there is more that we can do. New technology will play its part, but there's more that you can do now. Find out what in our next video. Again, that video <coughs> is available on the website. So if we just go a bit more into this, how is methane produced? Um, most of, of, of our methane is enteric methane. That's coming out of the mouths of animals. Uh, it's a nice headline to say it's farting. Uh, unfortunately, it's anatomically incorrect. It comes out of the mouth. Um, and it arises from this group of, of, of specialist <coughs> bacteria. They're not bacteria called archaea. They're this they're separate kingdom. Um, and they literally convert carbon dioxide and hydrogen into methane. Uh, it's a, they're, they're scavengers, basically, and so that's what they live off. Um, and, and methane is just a byproduct of that. The same thing happens in stored manures. Uh, the, it's a fermentation process without oxygen, anaerobic, uh, and, and the same thing happens in, in, in waste ponds, etc. You're just creating this anaerobic environment, and these, the, uh, of which then produces hydrogen and carbon dioxide, and a group of organisms produce methane. Um, and that's been going on, you know, millions and millions of years. And this naturally happens in all ruminants, happens to a lesser extent in monogastrics. Uh, uh, some monogastrics, including ourselves, do produce methane. It depends on the bug population you have. Um, in in non-ruminant animals, <coughs> uh, things like pigs, uh, the methane tends to arise from manure storage, 
uh, whereas ruminant animals, the, the, the dominant uh, cause is uh, enteric fermentation. Although the balance between the two depends on the agricultural system. If you have an indoor house system where all the material is uh, then put into uh, manure storage ponds, you can get quite a lot of methane coming from manure storage. In New Zealand, where most of the fecal and urinary excrement is, is deposited onto the ground, uh, we don't get as much uh, from these stored ponds. And, and once it's, just, you know, if manure is excreted onto the ground, um, you don't get a lot of methane from it. It doesn't form this anaerobic uh, process, so it's relatively minor. So for New Zealand in our grazing systems, it's enteric methane that's the big issue. So what influences how much methane we produce? I often get asked, you know, does a dairy cow produce more than a beef cow? Or does a cow produce more than a sheep? Ultimately, the biggest driver of methane emissions is how much an animal eats. Um, simply, there's a very strong relationship, and this relationship here I'm showing is just for sheep. I can show the same one for cattle. That as you <coughs> increase dry matter intake, the amount of methane simply goes up because it's a substrate-driven process. It's a fermentation process. The amount of substrate to ferment uh, influences how much methane comes out. So that's the biggest single relationship. Over 80% of the uh, driver of methane is, is, is dry matter intake. Um, and very roughly under New Zealand conditions, about 21 grams of methane are produced per kilogram of dry matter intake an animal eats. Now, it can, there are some things that, that influence that. High feeding levels uh, change that. When you feed at very high levels, you have a faster rate of passage of rumen digester. It doesn't ferment as much in the rumen. It ferments, some of it ferments further down the gut, in the, in the hind gut, and you don't get quite as much methane. Um, so, you know, uh, if you compared, say, a dairy cow at full lactation, its emissions per unit of, 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 of feed eaten is slightly less than it would be when it's a dry cow. Um, we can get individual feeds that, that can affect that. So the, the intake relationship applies for every feed, uh, but there are the quantity can drop from this 21 um, with certain kind of feeds. If you fed a diet of dominated by cereals, the concentrate feed stuff, you can bring the methane emissions down dramatically. If you fed 90% cereal, you'd get about a halving of methane. It also gets some some pretty interesting digestive processes and digestive upsets if you feed that amount. Uh, but you can find some feeds that reduce it. Uh, forage rape um, actually reduces emissions about 30%, so it's more like 14 to 15 kilograms of uh, methane per kilogram of dry matter intake. Uh, and that, forage brassicas in general seem to, but we only have good information for forage rape. Fodder beet, um, we have got some trials that showing something like fodder beet actually reduces emissions as well. Um, but at the level of a diet, that's hence I've bolded diet here, um, you, find, you tend to find it's very, very stable, around about 21 grams of methane for the diet. Because if you're going to change the diet, you need big changes for it to move away from that 21 grams. <laughs> like you, and that's a conservative figure. You'd need to, although if you fed 100% cereal, you halve emissions. If you feed 30 to 40% cereal, it doesn't change it. You need big changes in the diet. So there's a difference between individual feeds and what the diet is. So with fodder beet, we've got some information there, but you need more than 60% fodder beet in the diet. And once you've got more than 60% fodder beet, the amount of sugar in there makes you wonder if you've got subclinical acidosis anyway. Um, but uh, so at a diet level, it's actually much hard, very hard to change that, that figure of 21. Now, we've got that figure of 21. It's an approximate figure from a, a, a lot of measurements across New Zealand with cattle and sheep and different diets. Interestingly enough, the Australians a couple of years ago did a summary of their trials, and they came out with just over 21. Uh, the UK has now adopted a value of just over 21. So for, for mixed diets, it, it seems relatively constant at around this 21 grams of methane per kilogram of dry matter intake. More extreme diets, it can change it. Um, there are some additives you, you can think of that would reduce that. Um, Menensin, which is obviously used, 
uh, bloat control in some instances has, has been found in some cases to reduce emissions. Uh, we can put in some of these things, essential oils, some very odd products that might reduce emissions slightly. Uh, garlic, um, uh, there is an active product, allicin in garlic, that, that, that is a known antibacterial. Uh, but there's, in common here, the effect is generally small and it's highly variable. So if you, if you kind of looked at the experiments around the world, all you could conclude is it sometimes reduces emissions and it's usually quite small, but we can't predict what it will do. Lipids is a, a more interesting one. Um, it's, they do have an anti-methanogen effect, lipids. They do affect the microbial population. And roughly, we, like in the New Zealand diet, it's probably got about 3 3.5% three lipid. Um, but, and, and from international work, if you increase that by 1%, you'd get around a 4 to 5% drop in emissions. So if you could double it, you could argue that we might get about a 15% a drop. But the evidence is very variable. Um, for concentrate diets, it seems to work. For diets dominated by forage, it's much more questionable whether an increase in lipids will reduce methane. But all of these, you have to look at what's the economics of it. And the economics are not necessarily very positive on all of these things because they tend to have quite small reductions, but these can be quite uh, expensive to feed, etc. So it's the economics you need to look at as well. <clears throat> One thing we do know, and we're actually actively exploiting, is that animals do vary. You can feed two animals the same feed, the same quantity of feed, and their emissions can vary. Uh, and that is something we can exploit. We're used to exploiting genetic differences. Um, and so we have been working on this. And, and in New Zealand, we uh, have got the only uh, segregated flocks of animals. We've got a high emitting line and a low emitting line. And we've been selecting those since um, the late 2000s, 2009. <coughs> excuse, excuse me. And we now have, there's a difference of 10% between those lines. Between the high and low line, there's about a 10% difference. What we also know is that there is no effect on productivity, no detrimental effect. And, and in actual fact, the carcasses are slightly leaner on our low emitting lines. There's now work going on with the industry to roll this out to elite breeders. Uh, and methane, methane measurements being undertaken on farms this year to look at the, the feasibility of, of selection for low emissions. Uh, and we do have genomic, genomic markers for it. So I think within a few years we will see this being rolled out. We know it's there in sheep. We're just starting working on cattle. So nitrous oxide emissions. Uh, so where do they come from? Well, the basic issue is it's about how much nitrogen uh, is in our animal systems uh, and our plant systems as well. So where do we get nitrogen from? In a sense, there's two sources. You can put N fertilizer on. That's a new source of N. It brings N from somewhere else into your system. And you can have N fixation. That brings N into your system. So legumes can fix N from the atmosphere. They add new nitrogen. Effluent recycles. Uh, nitrogen. So if an animal eats nitrogen in the pasture, it recycles it and it can concentrate it in things like urine patches, uh, etc. So the only new sources of nitrogen are fertilizer and end fixation, but there's a lot of cycling of nitrogen uh, that the animal does. Uh, and it changes the, the natural cycling of, of N because it puts it into concentrated patches. So what happens when uh, urea, urine, and to some extent fecal material ammonium, and then there's a whole set of processes going by bugs in the soil, and, and it turns this ammonium into nitrate. And during that period, some nitrous oxide will come off. Then there's another process. We lose ammonia from the soil, ammonia volatilization, uh, and that, that sends up ammonia. And in actual fact, some of that comes straight back down in rain in the form of N, which then adds to the, to, the recycles the N from the uh, Ammonia volatilization adds N to the soil, goes into the same process of ammonium to, to nitrate. Then there's another thing. Well, we lose some of this nitrate by leaching. And what happens then, this actually ends up in waterways, and we get nitrous oxide coming off waterways. So even though it might not come off the soil, 
uh, because we're contributing nitrogen into a waterway, there'll be nitrous oxide comes off that. We call these emissions that, that put there. So we have these emissions of nitrous oxide from varying sources. The ones directly from the soil, which occur in the place where the N is deposited, we call these direct emissions. These ones that occur in a completely different geographical location, uh, uh, we call them indirect. So we have these direct emissions and indirect emissions. But they all arise from nitrogen being deposited or recycled in, in, in systems. If it's an arable system, the only source of N is, is N fertilizer. In, in grazing systems, it's, a, it's new, first, new N and recycled N that cause the issue. So how do we actually stop reducing these emissions? <clears throat> first question, or first issue, is how many people, actually, how many farmers actually know what their emissions are? Right, in water, lots of farmers are now trying to calculate, but how many farmers know what their emissions are? So MPI undertook a survey. Uh, this, this came out earlier this year. Only 2% of farmers know what their emissions are. Uh, and that means, how do you actually say, manage down your emissions when you don't actually know what they are in the first place? So to me, the first mitigation step for any enterprise is to know what your emissions currently are. Then you can say, well, what practices can I undertake to change them? So the first step of mitigation is quantification of emissions, because you can't manage what you don't know. Um, it's interesting that only 2% know, because how many farmers, particularly in the dairy sector, have got an overseer run? In theory, most of them. And if you have an overseer run, you can actually get greenhouse gases from it, because it's another button, literally. Do another click. You can get greenhouse gases. So in some instances, greenhouse, gases, greenhouse gas information is actually available, but it's not been looked at. Uh, and the same, you know, there aren't many sheep and beef farms probably have that, uh, and, and they will not have that. But for some farms, that they're really, this information is available. So farmers need to know what their emissions are. That's the very first step in mitigation. Um, so, okay, I've taken the step of quantifying my emissions. Where do they come from? One way you can look at it is, well, I, I break it down by a product. So, you know, where in, in a kilo of milk or a kilo of milk solids, where do my emissions actually arise? And the biggest single influence is enteric methane. So of this sort of around, this is for this particular farm, this is from Stuart Ledgard, uh, around about 11 and a half kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent uh, per kilogram of milk solids. The vast bulk, 65% of that, is coming from enteric methane. So if you're looking to reduce emissions, you are going to have to look at that. Some of, of the urine and dung and dairy effluent is, is another source, which is methane again. And then we get nitrous fertilizer, nitrous oxide. Um, so the really big emissions, and these are the on-farm emissions, and, and there's a tiny bit here of nitrous oxide, these are the ones that the farmer can manage on their farm. There are other emissions, which are, which are actually carbon dioxide, but these come from things like um, when you manufacture a fertilizer, you have carbon dioxide. When you transport a fertilizer, you have carbon dioxide. But they're handled in other sectors of the economy. The ones that we're looking at behind the farm gate are there's methane and nitrous oxide, and they dominate the, the emissions on a kilo of milk. The only one, interestingly enough, that, that we, when we count carbon dioxide from a farm is lime. Because if you put lime on, carbon dioxide actually comes from the lime. And it's not currently counted anywhere, so it's going to be counted um, in the agricultural sector. But it does show you that in a kilo of milk solids, it's those on-farm emissions are the way we have to manage down the greenhouse gas emissions from, the, say, the dairy sector. We can do similar... Um, uh, calculations for beef and sheep, but the variety of beef and sheep farms makes it much more difficult to do that. What is the average beef and sheep farm? Um, and so it's, it's more difficult to do. But this just shows it's the on-farm emissions that we really have to be concerned about when we talk about the emissions from uh, a milk product. And the same applies to, to meat products from the, uh, the non-dairy sector. <clears throat> 
So very broadly, where can we look for mitigation options in New Zealand agriculture? As I pointed out earlier, there's already a lot going on in farm efficiency that, that is having an impact on greenhouse gases. So that um, efficiency has um, been reducing at about, you know, the, 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 the greenhouse gases per kilogram of, of product have been decreasing by about 1% a year. So that's, you know, the efficiency is getting better. Uh, and that needs to continue. So increases in product, production efficiency will be a major component of any attempt to, to manage down emissions. They, that will happen. Um, and we, you know, that will happen because farmers stay, want, need to become more efficient to stay in business. And it's the efficient ones that survive and prosper. But we will need additional technologies. It's hard to see that we could manage down the emissions just by efficiency uh, to meet the targets the government is setting. It needs more than just efficiency. It is going to need some new technologies, uh, whether they're needed today or tomorrow or whether they're needed in 10, 15 years' time. New technologies would seem to be needed unless we see massive transformation in the sector, which comes on to the, the last point. Um, there are other things in play that will influence uh, agriculture, you know, the emissions from livestock. Um, water quality constraints, which may have the effect of curbing expansion uh, and may have the effect of changing land use in some sensitive catchment areas. Um, there will be moves towards lower emitting land uses. The current controversy, of course, around increasing forestry at the expense of pastoral land in some parts of the country. Change land use driven by economics. <coughs> Um, and the other one that, that is coming to the fore, um, things like horticulture. Um, they don't take up a lot of land, but 120,000 hectares is horticulture, but it's highly profitable. Uh, and there are expansion plans in horticulture. So are we going to see a combination of these things? We'll have greater efficiency, we'll have some new technologies, and we'll see other constraints like water influencing the size of the livestock sector, and we may see land use changes. We have always had land use change in New Zealand, from when, when we deforested to how we've changed <coughs> land between dairy and, and sheep. So you would expect in the next 30 to 40 years, that trend will continue because we're driven by economics. So there will be a combination of things that I think will lead to reduced emissions over time. Um, and so what is the potential to reduce? These are some work we did for this organization called the Biological Emissions Reference Group. The, this is myself and Andy Reisinger. Uh, we, that, that was set up to advise the government on what was the potential to mitigate. And so this was a, a, a joint industry government. Uh, and we formed a small group, working group uh, to, to look at this. So this was, again, a joint industry policy government issue that Andy and I were the key main authors of. Uh, and we looked at existing practices. We looked at things we would term emerging practices. And then we looked at the new technologies. And we compared these against an MPI baseline. Basically, what it says is that with our existing practices, we can make a small change. Um, uh, be, you know, if I was being generous, up to 10% on some farms. But we need these new emerging practices, you know, low emitting feeds, uh, low methane emitting animals. We, we've already proven they work. We just need to get them into practice. They would add some more. But if we want to make these big reductions, you know, this is close to halving of our emissions, we need these new practices. So this just said that given what we've got now, we can make some small changes. We've got some technologies that are emerging, which allow us to make some bigger changes. These are already proven at the, uh, at, at least at the experimental scale. These are being developed. And, and so in the long run, we will need new technologies, but there are some things that can be done in the short run. That was the message coming really from uh, that biological emissions reference group. <clears throat> Farmers have been asking, what can I do to reduce emissions on my farm? Well, there are three gases we need to reduce, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane. But on farm, it's particularly about the last two. Lots of small steps can add up to make a big difference. The good news is that greenhouse gas emissions from New Zealand agriculture are no longer going up. 
thanks to farmers' efforts to become more and more productive and efficient over the years. As a result, greenhouse gases emitted per unit of product are going down. Without all this great work, emissions from agriculture in New Zealand would be about 30% higher than now to produce the same amount of food. But we need to reduce emissions, not just keep them steady. There's no magical formula here, but there are several things that can be done on farms right now. And some will have other benefits too. You know your business better than anyone, so you're in the best place to work out which of these are achievable. Here's what some farmers are doing already that you might want to consider for your farm. First, find out what your farm's greenhouse gas emissions are and include them in your planning. Depending on the farm, it might be that some of those options can save you time and money. In a nutshell, methane emissions are related to the total amount of dry matter eaten. Nitrous oxide emissions depend on the total amount of nitrogen going through your farm via feed and fertiliser. So what steps can be taken to change these quantities while still running a profitable business? Look carefully at the feeds used. Can you use feeds with lower nitrogen or higher energy content to get animals to market quicker? Would a less intensive system work for you? It might be reducing fertiliser inputs and stocking rates, changing the ratio of your stock type or a once a day milking. You could try using precision technologies for improving the amount and timing of your fertiliser application. Look at the balance between individual animal performance and stocking rate. Could you run slightly fewer animals and focus more on getting the most out of each animal to keep production up? You could also consider the balance of your land use to reduce livestock emissions. Many farmers are now integrating trees onto their less productive land and there is government support to help do this. For some farms, diversifying some of the land used to cropping or horticulture could reduce overall emissions and dependence on one income stream. Rest assured, you're not alone in your efforts. Scientists are working hard on new solutions with some very promising results. Some of them are being trialled already. In the future, it's likely we'll be able to breed low methane animals or use inhibitors and vaccinations to reduce the amount of methane that animals belch out. We're all working towards the same goal, and any small step is a step in the right direction. Remember to check out our website for lots more information. Thanks for watching. And Phil will do a lot more on case studies on farm this afternoon, uh, looking at various options to reduce emissions. So that's just a very high level overview. And <clears throat> so just to follow on from that, you know, it is about managing dry matter intake because if it's a relatively constant amount per unit of dry matter intake, if you want to reduce emissions just without new technologies, it's a matter of how much animals eat. And the same with N. If you can actually alter the amount of N that's cycled, and that means that N can come from various sources, you can uh, start to think about reducing emissions. But, you know, some of the practices increased genetic merit, which comes back to that, can you have a fewer number of animals, but each animal produces more? Works for some, not necessarily big, big changes, but it, it can work. Uh, improving animal health, improving reproductive performance, it means you have less, uh, less replacements, you, you, you have less animals that aren't productive. <clears throat> Even things like improving pasture quality to get an animal to market quicker. Um, it, ultimately, if you can get an animal to market a month earlier, it produces less emissions um, uh, than, you know, at the same weight. Um, so th putting it crudely, the, the quicker you get rid of the animal to the works, the less emissions it actually uh, would have. So these are all just suggestions that, that, that need to be looked at on an individual farm basis. Um, just that around individual animal performance and, and stocking rates, and Phil will go into this in more detail this afternoon. But if you look at the intensity, emissions per unit of product, um, a higher milking cow ha ha has a lot less um, emissions per unit of product than a lower milking cow. And, and that's the same with, as I said, reduced replacement rate. If you can get it down and if you don't do other things that, that, that overcome it, you may be able to reduce emissions by a certain amount. And Phil, again, we'll go into some examples. Uh, said managing nitrous. We do know that there is, you know, at the end of the day, nitrous oxide is driven by how much N you've got. We feed our animals far too much nitrogen. Um, my background is a rumen nutritionist. Uh, uh, and, you know, 
depending on the time of, of, of year, we do not need 24% crude protein in our diets. But we're at many times of the year, that's what we're putting in. We need 14 to 18, depending on the time of year. In some maintenance animals, it could be down as low as 12. If you are feeding excess protein, it comes straight out in uh, urine and dung. So if you fed a lower protein feed, can that reduce emissions? Uh, and yes, it can. If you move, say, to something like maize silage, which has a much lower crude protein content, the animal doesn't need the high protein contents, can you incorporate something with a lower protein content? And that definitely reduces emissions. Fodder beets in the same camp as well. The problem is, again, it comes around to system issues. If I in, in changed to maize silage, um, yes, I get lower protein, but it might have lower energy than the grass. Um, and then if I have a lower energy feed, I need to get more of it to produce the same amount of milk, which means I might increase my dry matter intake, so methane goes up, but nitrous oxide goes down. System issues. Um, bit the same with fodder beet. Yeah, fodder beet, um, very high sugar content, uh, low end, it potentially very good. But how you feed fodder beet out, if you're feeding fodder beet out in very, very wet conditions, you run the danger of increasing nitrous oxide emissions. So again, let's look at what happens at a system rather than an individual practice. Always, this will work. Optimize fertilizer and effluent. The better, you know, the more you optimize that, the better. Uh, if you're already optimized, of course, you can't do much about it. But you know, do, are we using the right amount of fertilizer, et cetera? Are we making the best use of effluent? These are just efficiency issues. This is a very interesting one uh, because this is obviously looked at for water issues. If we take animals off pasture at times when you, you may leach uh, more nitrogen or where nitrous oxide emissions increase because of soil conditions, can we get around that by taking animals off pasture at sensitive times? I think the evidence for water is, is pretty strong. The evidence for uh, greenhouse gases is no, nowhere near as strong. Simply because if you take animals off, yes, they're not depositing nitrogen, but they still have urine and nitrogen, urine and fecal excretions, and you might have to store that. You have to store it in some way, and that means increased methane emissions. So you actually might reduce nitrous oxide, you might reduce uh, end leaching, which are all good things, but you might get an increase in greenhouse gas in methane uh, because of the stored effluent. So the, the studies that have been done are pretty inconclusive in terms of greenhouse gases uh, because you may just simply be trading one gas for another. Um, so when we look at some feeds, you know, well said with fodder beet, certainly if you uh, we see, and it's mainly because of the low end content. If you had a winter feed of fodder beet versus something like kale, you'll get much lower emissions uh, simply because of the end content. Plantain is very interesting, and there's a lot of work being done on plantain, particularly by Dairy and Zed, around um, water, around leaching. Can you, does moving from a, a straight uh, general grass clover pasture uh, to something like uh, plantain? Can you uh, reduce leaching and can you reduce nitrous oxide emissions? And certainly if you think of plantain monocultures, um, we do get lower uh, N2O emissions than you do from grass. It's partly because of it has lower N in it, but it also seems to create different conditions in the soil uh, such that um, emissions are reduced. You can put the same uh, nitrogen input onto a plantain as a, as a, a grass-based one, and you get less emissions even at the same nitrogen input. So there is something other than it just has lower N in its leaves. Is that the DCD type thing? Right? Well, it could well be there's some inhibitory compound in the roots that's ex exudated or something that is causing um, th this effect. We, we term those biological N inhibitors. We haven't proven that. But the, we, what we have is, is just measured lower emissions, the mechanism we don't actually understand. Uh, and, and this is, but, but what we also know is that, yes, if you fed 100% plantain, but in a system, how many people are going to feed 100% plantain? And, and for how much of the year? So what happens if you actually have a mixed ward that contains your usual pasture species plus a certain proportion of plantain? And, and what we see is that, to get large reductions, you need uh, a lot of plantain in the diet. 
Once you get to 30, so well, you know, it's somewhere higher than 15, but at 30, you get quite big reductions here. Um, uh, and then that does depend, any, any reduction depends on your ability at the system level to keep these high levels of plantain in. And that's the, the really big question. Can you maintain enough plantain at the system level to bring these benefits for, for both water and nitrous oxide? Interesting, uh, interesting enough, we do have some evidence from one trial. Well, we've done two trials with, with plantain. One showed nothing, and the other showed a massive reduction with plantain. Unfortunately, the baseline, it was compared with, with silage, the baseline emissions, I told you that number of 21, we got 34 as that baseline emission with pasture silage. And as we increased the, the quantity of plantain up to, a, a, I think we got a 60%, it went down to about 21. So we're not sure whether there was something in the silage that caused this very strange spike. And there were also some issues with the measurements and some issues uh, with the feed intake estimates. So we're repeating that trial and that will take place in, in March down here, uh, but in much more controlled conditions. So at the moment, the jury's out. I very much doubt it because we don't really find many of those types of feeds reduce it, but we're double checking that one. We're also checking because of this change, obviously it does something in the soil. We're looking at if it changes soil carbon as well. So we have work going on in the Waikato that's looking at soil carbon cycling as well because it's changing microbial processes. So what's the net effect of that change in microbial processes? So this is you know, ongoing work. Um, so what I said that there is this need for new technologies. Um, what are the technologies that we actually have on the horizon? <clears throat> and I, um, just to summarize, low emitting sheep. Uh, we are, I think, only two to three years away before we will be having low emitting sheep on farms. Um, it's been tested across about a million animals um, with breeders who control a million animals, should I say. Um, what's the kind of reduction we would expect? Currently, there's 10% difference between our highs and lows, which is about a 5% difference then from the average. Um, and our breeders tell us it can go higher than that. Optimistically, they said they think they could get a 20% difference. There is a bit of a caveat. What's the mechanism by which this happens? And the mechanism is that we get an increased rate of passage and a big drop in rumen size. We've dropped rumen size by 20% within three generations. That's a very big change in rumen size. And you wonder how far can that go? We still want ruminants to process high, you know, fibrous feeds, process cellulose. Do we compromise that if we actually shrink the rumen size down too much? So is there some limit that we don't want to go below for rumen size? Do we, on the other hand, create a woolly pick? It becomes more of a monogastric with fur. Um, so we do wonder about what is the limit there? We haven't met it yet, but we do have concerns around the physiological basis of that trait. We've got a gene marker or what Yeah, got a genomic marker. Yeah. Yeah. Then, but we need to confirm the genomic markers in larger numbers because as you start with these, you know, we've got small flocks, uh, but we now need to go out to the industry to confirm the genomic markers. That's what's happening with beef and lamb New Zealand now. Um, so what about low emitting cattle? Um, we're only just starting with that, so we've now, um, you know, the, the, my uh, research center is, is working alongside LIC and CRV, and we're going to start a testing program uh, in their young bull program. So they actually test young bulls, um, and, and those young bulls that are tested by those two breeding companies sire the majority of, of cows in New Zealand. Uh, and there's about 350 in total, and we're going to start measuring uh, emissions from these young bulls. And then we will monitor that progress and whether their offspring reduce emissions. It will be a long-term program. In short term, we can focus on about 350 bulls. In the long term, to um, check whether it's working in, in the uh, national herd, we will probably have to measure about 10,000 animals. Um, this is going to be a big, big job. So this has been done you know, very strongly in conjunction with the industry, uh, and the industry is very favorable at the moment. Obviously worried about do you get any negatives from the, you know, the production side? Do you affect prolificacy? Do you affect 
health traits or whatever, but we can't at the moment see any downsides. You do have to look at, well, if you, if you introduce another selection trait, how much do you reduce selection pressure on these, you know, the, the, the other traits already? So there's still a lot of work going on around that. But we're very, pretty optimistic that this can be introduced within that time frame. Because it does feel quite counterintuitive to have a smaller room for women. Um, I, it does, and that's, what, that's why I said I've put some caveats around how far you can go. But what we've done is digestibility measurements, and we can't see that the digestibility is going down. Uh, my own view and, and I, is that when you look at the evolution of ruminants, they in actual fact evolved on very poor diets, and diets that actually contrasted very strongly. In you know, some seasons they'd be very poor because there was no grassland management. And so herbivores actually evolved under quite fibrous feeds. We're in actual fact feeding herbivores much higher quality feeds than they evolved on. So there is some flexibility in processing these much higher quality feeds than they evolved on, such there is probably uh, you can reduce the uh, rumen size up to a point without affecting anything because it evolved for different feeds than we are giving it now. That's my explanation. Whether it's true, <laughs> I don't know. But it seems to be borne out. We are not finding a drop in, in digestibility. We're finding a rate of increase in passage. Um, but you can still digest high-quality feeds down uh, at the lower gut as well as in the, the foregut. So we'll wait and see, but I do have a wonder about how far can you push it. Um, but we'll wait and see. So the cattle program's just starting. In theory, there is a, a program already with CRV that claims they have animals that have less urine N excretion, and so would then reduce nitrous oxide. Unfortunately, it's actually what they're using to gauge that are proxy measures of nitrogen in milk, and they actually haven't got rigorous measures of whether there is less N in urine and less urine production. It's still a, a, a proxy uh, trait. And there is a big program going on funded uh, by the government and, and the industry. Um, so in theory, you can actually now use a bull that supposedly got less N excretion. In practice, I don't think we would say anything about nitrous oxide because we haven't seen the data yet. But in theory, you could select for low N emitting animals, but, but I think we're a bit away from that in practice. It's pretty close, closely related to BW, I think. Yeah, it, it's hard to know, but uh, it, I saw the evidence and it was so obtuse, it was difficult to draw too much from it. It looked to me to be exactly what you should be doing research on to find out whether it was true, but you couldn't really make any claims about it yet until we got a lot more information. So I think it's a good research program, but I wouldn't like to draw any conclusions from it. Uh, methane vaccine. Um, nice anecdote here. I started working on, on this in 2004, uh, and we did the first trial in New Zealand in 2005. And Nathan Guy came to see me... Um, Oh, when he was Minavag, probably about 214, and I'd spoken to him over the years, and he came in and he said, oh, methane vaccine, is it still 10 years away? Because we've always been saying it's 10 years away, and we don't see, you know, even tomorrow it will be 10 years away. Uh, and it is, you know, that, that this is technically very, very challenging, but probably the most exciting technology we potentially have, simply because... If I get, you can vaccinate an animal, in theory, it then produces antibodies, and it could keep producing them all its life, just as we're immune from measles if we've had a measles jab. It's, it's recycled in saliva. So in theory, you could give an animal one jab, and then it, it will reduce its emissions for life. And you can do it to every single animal. If I had a feeding solution, well, I'm going to feed some, some novel feed. Well, I can't can do it for dairy cows because I can control those. How do I give it to all those sheep walking around the hills? But I could vaccinate everything. And so every animal in the world, in theory, could have a vaccination. And it might modify its emissions for life. So in terms of a global uh, universal solution, it's fabulous. Technically, it's very, very challenging. And we really have been working seriously for about 15 years on it. What we've got to is that we can produce antibodies so that these are, and, and they will affect the growth of methanogens, these nasties that produce methane. We can do that in the lab. Uh, 
So we can vaccinate an animal, isolate the antibodies, put them into pure cultures of methanogens, and we reduce their growth and methane emissions. But it doesn't seem to be reducing it from the animal, and we don't know why. Uh, and that's what we're working on now. So we've got to the stage where we can actually produce the right antibodies in the right amount, but they're not binding specifically to the, those methanogens that we are trying to affect. Um, so this is going on, and it is, it's always five to 10 years away, but at some stage we'll have to give up or we'll succeed. But we we'll keep on that one simply because its global potential is so high, but technically incredibly challenging. The next one down, inhibitors, these are chemicals basically that you will give the animal and it will modify those methanogens. It will modify the activity of methanogens. We have got a product from a company called DSM that has now been registered in Europe. They're trying to get it registered in New Zealand uh, and trials with it and some very extensive and long-term animal trials are getting reductions in excess of 30% in the latest big trial in, uh, of 10,000 animals in Canada. In feedlots, they've got reductions of over 50%. And that's seemingly without compromising animal performance. They say feed efficiency is increased. I haven't seen the published work on that, but I've seen the published work on methane reductions. From a New Zealand perspective, the problem is you have to feed it with every mouthful of feed. It breaks down very rapidly in the rumen. Uh, if you fed it now, in an hour and a half time, it's gone. Uh, and such that if you say in a dairy cow, you might better feed it morning and afternoon milk. Its reduction potential is much, much smaller, closer to about 6%, because it, it, it breaks down so rapidly, it's not working on a lot of the feed. So what the company is doing now is working on slow release formulations so that you may feed it once a day or twice a day, but it, it, it is gradually released. So they're looking at coatings for it, things like that. Um, the alternative is to do things like, um, can I put it into a bolus? If you think of zinc capsules, you think of CapTec boluses. Could you put it into a slow release bolus so that it released it gradually over time? The problem with that particular product is that the quantity required really makes it completely uh, non-feasible to put it in a bolus. We have put it in boluses, uh, but it lasts about 14 days, uh, which means you can't be putting a bolus in every 14 days, but some of these coatings could do that. That's that, this, this product, and that is the closest to market, and I think we'll see that on the market, particularly aimed at confined animals, feedlot systems, uh, intensive housed dairy cows. Uh, that will come onto the market in the next couple of years. We don't know the economics. We haven't seen any pricing yet. Um, but an alternative is some work that's gone on in New Zealand that uh, was led by the Pastoral Greenhouse Gas Research Consortium. I co-funded some of it, uh, where we have also got some inhibitors as well, and they are undergoing long-term animal trials. And they work at a much lower concentration. So we focused on things that work at a very low concentration that could then be encapsulated into boluses, uh, with a target of a couple of hundred days. They're just going through trials now. Um, they a long way away. Uh, we're probably where DSM was in about 2013, and it's taken them a long time to get where they are now because then the amount of evidence you need in terms of things like both the efficacy for greenhouse gases, toxicology, safety, all take a lot of time and a lot of money. And then you have to manufacture these things. Only a global company can actually have the resources to manufacture them in the quantities you need. So you do need then global partners. So although in New Zealand we might develop something, it would need a global partner simply because of the quantities you would have to manufacture. The kind of quantities we use them in, you buy them at laboratory scale, very expensive, but you need to produce them in industrial quantities very cheaply. But I think what we have done, and the great thing about inhibitors, Yes, some will come on the market. We've shown them to be effective. And that's the issue. We've actually shown that you can knock out methane without affecting performance. And that is a big breakthrough to actually show that because there were some theoretical arguments that if you knocked out methane, you would decrease fiber digestibility and have a detrimental effect on the animal. That does not seem to be happening. 
And, and so that's why that one, that proof of concept is very, very important. And I think within two to five years, you'll be seeing products on the market in New Zealand that allow reductions. Now, in some systems, 30%, that doesn't mean it reduces emissions across the economy by 30%. <clears throat> Then you might have seen a heck of a lot of stuff around a couple of things. You know, have we got low emitting feeds? The two that have been very well publicized, uh, a lot of arguments, oh, ha haven't we got a genetically modified ryegrass that's going to change the world? No, we have not. What there are are uh, programs to increase the lipid content of ryegrass. Lipids, we know in some circumstances, reduce emissions. And so there is a development program, genetic modification, to increase lipids. We know they've had success at the individual plant scale, and now they're looking to see they can have success in increasing lipids at a much larger field scale. There have been no animal trials where this material has been fed to an animal to find out if it reduces emissions. It's still very much at the laboratory stage. So the idea that has been promulgated in some quarters that unless we have genetic modification, we cannot reduce methane emissions, unfortunately, adding two and two together and coming up with five. It's, it's promising, increasing lipids, whether that reduces the methane emissions is still to be determined. Seaweed, <clears throat> the, the very big headlines, and there were some last week. Um, so there is a red seaweed, and I always forget its name and can't pronounce it, that reduces emissions. And I'm absolutely convinced it does. We did some work in 2011. The reason why, it produces naturally two chemicals, uh, which are halogen compounds. Um, one of them is dichlorobro dichlorobromomethane, and the other one is bromoform. We have known for 50 years that these products reduce methane. Uh, chloroform is of the same chemical group. We know chloroform, and I've worked with chloroform to reduce methane. Absolutely convinced it reduces methane. There's no issue about it. The problem is these, these, these are nasty chemicals. They are not nice chemicals. Dichlorobromomethane is a banned chemical. It's banned under the Montreal Protocol. Um, you cannot produce it globally. It is banned. Mm -hmm. Now, something produces it naturally. Is that okay? <laughs> so we took the decision in, and we, you know, in discussions with the industry, we wouldn't want to proceed with this because A, it, these, are, these are ozone destroying chemicals and ozone you know, is something we don't want to destroy. They're also carcinogens. They're known carcinogens uh, for humans uh, and, so, and they're nasty products. So we've always taken the decision, well, we're not sure about that because there's a consumer acceptability I have no issues that it will reduce emissions. Is it going to be acceptable? And then you've actually got to produce the stuff. The work so far has been done with a tropical seaweed, this red tropical seaweed that grows naturally in Hawaii, will grow off Australia. It doesn't grow naturally here. Uh, we do have a temperate variant of it, uh, but can we produce it? I just sat down and worked out that if we wanted to reduce emissions across the dairy herd by 10%, we'd need 13,000 hectares of seaweed. Um, so we've got to figure out how to grow it. We'd have to uh, dry it, process it, transport it. Uh, and so is it a practical solution? And is it an acceptable solution? So yes, massive amounts of publicity. It will reduce emissions if you feed it. I have no doubt about that. Whether it's acceptable to feed it um, from both an animal perspective, an environmental perspective, and a human perspective, this is nasty stuff to work with. Um, uh, uh, you can pick up a signal of the, the chemicals above where the seaweed's growing. Um, so I think it becomes not an issue whether it reduces emissions. It's more of an issue, is it an acceptable way? Now, we may have to accept risk that, that the, the, you know, a lot of these things, they can be carcinogens, but if they're fed in small amounts, it may never induce cancer. But it's that perception issue that you have to worry about rather than the actuality. Uh, DCD was taken off the market because it was found in, in, in products. Uh, but it was found in absolutely minute quantities, and it is not a dangerous chemical. So it was not the actuality of whether it was dangerous. It was the perception of whether it was dangerous. So all of these have to do that. 